Welcome to part two of module four in genomic selection. In this module, we're looking whether genomic selection works by reviewing results in the published literature. Here is the second study that we're going to look at. It's actually quite related to the first study produced by the same group. It's also looking at various traits in spring barley. And here is their training population. It's actually the same as we saw in that previous study that we uh, went through. 168 lines tested uh, developed in the breeding program and tested from 1999 to 2004. Of those 168 lines, 133 of them were used to produce progeny, and those progenies are then divided up into what we would call the prediction populations. Phenotyping the training population is shown here. It's a fairly large study. Augmented design is used, and here is the information on SNP genotyping, same as we showed in the previous study. Here's how this one is set up and why it's different from the previous study. Same training population, so I won't go through that. And here is our uh, beginning of our five prediction sets. In this case, though, these 96 new breeding lines were not the prediction sets themselves. These are lines that were phenotyped and genotyped. The training population data from up here was used to predict the value of each of these 96 lines. So now for these 96 lines, you have both their phenotype and their predicted values. Based on the phenotypes, they selected the 10 best lines for Fusarium head blight resistance using phenotypic selection. They also, of those 96 lines, selected the 10 best based on their estimated breeding values from genomic selection. They did the same thing for another Fusarium head blight related trait. Don, which is deoxynivalanol content. It's a toxin produced by the fungus. And so they t selected the 10 best for low Don values and the 10 best for low Don using genomic selection. They did the same thing in the second prediction set, the third prediction set, and actually the fourth and the fifth. But this fourth and the fifth one, they also selected the 10 best for yield using phenotypic selection and the 10 best of those 96 lines for yield using genomic selection. And then the same thing was done in the fifth and final set. So what they can do now is look at the value of the uh, 96 lines that were the selection candidates, compare them to the uh, phenotypes that you get from the lines that were advanced by phenotypic selection, and also compare them to the lines that were advanced using genomic selection. And here's just some details on the phenotyping of each of those uh, progeny uh, prediction populations. I'm not going to go through that. Here are the results. Here's accuracy using scheme one, basically uh, using the training population and uh, the prediction population and the training population the same. And here's your various accuracies for those. And, but here's what we're really interested in, looking how scheme two the results from scheme two and whether genomic selection was working or not. So for trait yield, here's the average yield of the uh, selection candidates from the, the various prediction populations. And we selected the best out of those doing phenotypic selection. And here is the average yield of the selections that were done by based on phenotypes. And you can see, of course, they're quite a bit superior to the unselected selection candidates. And here's the average yield of the lines that are advanced uh, and tested based on their breeding values predicted from genomic selection. And again, though the average value of those lines is also superior to the unselected selection candidates. But in this case, phenotypic selections certainly were better than the genomic selection selections. And we could estimate the relative efficiency of genomic selection for yield by looking at the gains from genomic selection divided by the gains from phenotypic selection. And here the relative efficiency of genomic selection for yield is 0.34. So for yield, the genomic selection did not work as well as phenotypic selection. And really you go back up and look at accuracy and that's pretty much what you would predict. That phenotypic selection would be better than genomic selection based on one cycle. Now let's look at the uh, Fusarium head blight traits. All right. So here again is the phenotype of the selection candidates. 
about 20 percent. The line selected based on phenotypic selection is lower and that's the way you want it. You want lower values for fusarium head blight, less disease, and for genomic selection, selections, the uh, average phenotype the average phenotype of those lines was even lower than what you got for phenotypic selection or of course in the unselected set. For the uh, toxin levels we saw the same trend. The unselected selection candidates had the most toxin. Phenotypic selection was effective at reducing toxin and genomic selection was a little even more effective at reducing toxin levels than we saw with the phenotypic selections. In fact, here, when we look at the relative efficiency of genomic selection, it's actually more efficient to do genomic selection for these fusarium head blight traits than it is to do phenotypic selection. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's a little bit surprising, but yet our accuracies from cross-validation would, would suggest that genomic selection is going to be better for um, fusarium head blight and Don than it would be for yield. They also did a nice cost analysis here. The cost of phenotype aligned for yield was $60. For fusarium head blight it's resistance, $40. And for toxin was $20. So the phenotype aligned for all three of these traits would cost you about $120. And you could genotype align for with 384 markers for only $20. So cost effectiveness wise, genomic selection is quite a bit better than phenotyping. Here's another publication that uses Scheme 2 to assess whether genomic selection is working. This one is in winter wheat, and I'm one of the, I, well, actually, I'm in the PI for this project, and so I'm a co author on this paper. Here is our training population 470 lines from uh, current breeding lines from my breeding program. And here's how we phenotype them I tested two years, three locations, six environments for yield. Our G by E analysis suggested we had two different clusters of environments. One we'll call WOO and the other one we'll call NWO. Uh, we used an augmented design in each of those locations because of, due to the size of the population. And we had about 4,550 SNPs generated by genotyping by sequencing. Here is the layout of how we uh, assess the effectiveness of genomic selection. Here is our training population the 470 lines phenotyped and genotyped the data here was used to generate the GS model now these 470 lines though are derived from 21 parents so we also phenotyped the 21 parents in independent studies at different sets of environments and we are going to use these as our prediction population so we use the progeny of those 21 parents to build the model our training population and then we're going to see whether that model can predict the value of the 21 parents and here's details on how they were phenotyped and here's our results using accuracy within environments so basically using our training population as our prediction population so it's a scheme one and within environments our GS accuracy was actually pretty good and it's much lower though when we build the model based on data from one environment to predict values in a different environment as would be expected now we're dealing with a lot more different G by E patterns and accuracy will go down but all in all our models are actually fairly accurate based on the training population and here's our results trying to validate it so here's the observed value of the 21 parents for yield in Worcester, Ohio, one of our locations. And here is their predicted value based on the model built from their progeny. And we have a correlation here of 0.45 between the observed phenotypes and the predicted values. And the interesting thing is, is if you were doing some selection here, if you wanted to select the lines with the best predicted value, in other words, the line shown in this box up here, You'd select those five lines in that box, and their average yield was 76.4 bushels an acre, which is significantly greater than the average yield of 72.5. In fact, four out of those five selections were actually above average. We could also compare that to if you wanted to say, well, what's, what, were the, what was the value, the phenotypic value of the five lines with the lowest 
estimated breeding values. In other words, the lines shown in these boxes. In this case, the average yield of those ones were 70.5. And for the fact, the average yield of those lines was below average. So we would conclude here that genomic selection was fairly effective, nice correlation, and some selection advantage for picking the lines predicted to have the highest yields. We also looked at this uh, looking at average yield over all of our test environments, not just the ones in Worcester, Ohio. And again, here is the observed yield of the 21 parents, and here is their predicted yield based on models based on built on their progeny. The correlation is not as good here, only 0.25. But again, if we were to use this in selection, select the five best ones, their average yield is 1.6, which is greater than the average. In fact, four out of five of those selected lines are above average. And you can see the, the average of yield of the four lines, the five lines that had the lowest predicted values. So, and again, genomic selection seems to be able to predict some, to some degree the, uh, what lines might be best in this study. We'll continue this in the third part of Module 4.